I, I came across something and I wanted to uh, read it to you. It says, one day the census taker called and wrote down in a book, and so, as I was hanging round, I thought I'd take a look. He had our names and ages all and put down dad's vocation. And after mother's name, he wrote, she had no occupation. Why, mother's up before it's light and through the work she races. She starts the breakfast, straightens things, and washes all the faces. She packs our lunches, finds our books. Of course, it keeps her busy. She washes iron sweeps and dust. You'd think she would be dizzy. She bakes a cake and maybe pies. She finds some time for sewing. There's mending making over too because we all are growing. Then dinner comes and dishes next. First one thing, then another. And when our homework bothers us, we say, please help us, mother. So she keeps going all the time, and though she's often weary, she never gets real out of sorts. She's always gay and cheery. She keeps so busy every day. She keeps so busy every day and sure needs some vacation. And yet the census man wrote down, she had no occupation. Some of you can identify with that, you know. Uh, a lot of our ladies in here, you know, um, you'll be somewhere and you'll have to fill out some forms and they'll say, they'll, they'll look at your wife. And they'll say, and, uh, and what's your occupation? And, you know, if, if, if you're a housewife or whatever, you know, you, you can just tell. They sort of write that down with a little bit of a question mark, you know. You know, I'm sure some of you were angels as children. I'm sure some of you were. And, um, and you know, our mothers, you know, there was those days when she hugged us and kissed us and we brought her tears of joy. And then there were other days when she wanted to strangle us. And thank the Lord, she let us live. Amen? <laughs> Others weary of the noise. Mothers play with girls and boys. Others scold because we fell. Mothers kiss and make it well. Others love us more or less. Mothers love with steadiness. Others pardon, hating yet. Mothers pardon and forget. Others keep the ancient score. Mothers never shut the door. Others grow incredulous, but mothers still believe in us. Others throw their faith away. Mothers pray and pray and pray. We sure appreciate you ladies. We, seriously, we'd be in a mess without you. If you have your Bibles this morning, too, to turn to Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy 33, and in verse 24, Deuteronomy 33, verse 24, and of Asher, he said, let Asher be blessed with children, let him be acceptable to his brethren, and let him dip his foot in oil. Thy shoes shall be iron and brass, and as thy days, so shall thy strength be. There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun, who rideth upon the heaven in thy help and in his excellency on the sky. Lord, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, God, we should appreciate all the mothers. Lord, we pray that you'd encourage them. Lord, they go through a lot of private struggles, and, and uh, Lord, certainly their, their uh, workload always stays heavy. God, we do pray that today you'd bless all the mothers in this room. And God, we pray that you'd bless them richly, and Lord, that the blessing would go beyond today. God, help us now as we look at your book. We pray that once again, Lord, you would help us. And Lord, you'd speak something to our hearts. You'd give us something we could carry away. Lord, that would help us, Lord, to live for thee, to make headway for thee, to come out further ahead tomorrow, Lord, than we were today. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to draw your attention to that last phrase of verse 25. It says, and as thy days so shall thy strength be. You know, the blessings uh, in this chapter are all different, and they are all very specific. Um, they are given to certain specific people. Man, there's a blessing for Reuben, and there's a blessing for Levi, and there's a blessing for Judah, and there's a blessing for Joseph. And, and, um, and these blessings are specific to each one. You know, this chapter is not a God bless everybody. 
You know, sometimes people pray like that, you know, Lord, just bless everybody. And you know, the Lord can do that. But you know, uh, when the Lord decides to bless, usually he has something very specific in mind. And uh, God does not pour out his blessings just randomly. Now, there are general blessings. There are. There are blessings this morning in this city, all over Edmonton, people were blessed. You know, um, he sendeth his sun to rise on the evil and the good, and he sendeth his rain on the just and the unjust. And all over Edmonton this morning, there was peace. Boy, in parts of the world, that is just not the case. There was peace, and there was just uh, people could just enjoy another day. You know, you know what that is? That's just a general blessing. There are general blessings that fall on everybody. But there are also very targeted blessings. And he says to Asher in this verse, as thy days, so shall thy strength be. In other words, in good days and in bad days, you will have all the strength you need for as long as you need it. Now, that's quite a statement. This is not the experience of every Christian or every child of God. And of course, you know, we're drawing that spiritual application here. You know, God didn't give this blessing to every tribe, but he gave it to Asher. Um, this is not the blessing of every Christian or every child of God. You know, you know, some Christians, it just seems like they never have enough strength. Some of them, it seems like they run out of strength. Um, you know, it just, you know, when you're strong and you're, and you're healthy, there's things that you can do. There's a load that you can carry. There's things you can endure that other people can't. And why is that? Just because you're strong. Just because you're strong. It would be wonderful to have this blessing. And this blessing comes, of course, in the context because God gives it. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. You know, Paul said to the Corinthians, he said, covet earnestly the best gifts. What an interesting remark. It, it sort of implies that not all the gifts are the same. He said, it's okay to really hope for the best ones. As thy days, so shall thy strength be. All the strength you need for as long as you need it. Man, I'll take that one. Strength for every trial, for every labor, for every stress, for every emergency, for every dark tunnel, for every tragedy, for every battle, for every stage of life. As thy days, so shall thy strength be. Keep your place there and look at Joshua 14 with me. Every stage of life. As thy days, he said, uh, he said, Asher, the, the thought is, if, if you live to be 110, he said, you'll have all the strength you need till the last day. As thy days, however long your days are, so shall thy strength be. Joshua 14. In Joshua 14, uh, Joshua is, um, you know, he's been in that process of dividing up the land. You know, Israel has come in and they have generally conquered the land as, as a whole. And now they're going to go in tribe by tribe and conquer the pockets that remain. And um, in Joshua 14, verse 6, let's begin to read there. Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. You remember there were twelve spies sent in, and um, ten gave a bad report. Ten said, we can't do this. But two men said, we can easily do this. And the two men were Joshua and Caleb. And now it's 45 years later. You know, you know what God did? Those 10 men, they, they, they sufficiently discouraged 
the multitudes of Israel so that they gave up hope that God would keep his promise. And then they began to murmur against the Lord. And that's when the Lord dropped the hammer and said, okay. He said, you know, I'm not going to let you go in. He said, I'll let your children go in. But he said, I'm not going to let you go into the land. So he said, but you're going to wander for the next 40 years until this generation dies out. Um, there were two men that gave the good opinion and tried to sway it the other way, and that was Joshua and Caleb. So here it is 45 years later, okay? Again, verse 7. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to a spy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I, wholly, that means completely, followed the Lord my God. And Moses sware unto me on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy foot have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these forty and five years, even since the day the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. He said, and today I'm eighty-five. And yet... I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. Now, therefore, give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake in that day. For thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there. The Anakims were giants. And the cities were great and fenced. If so be, the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb, the son of Jephuni, Hebron, for an inheritance. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephuni, the Kenizzite, unto this day, because that he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron before was Kerjath Arba, which Arba was a great man among the Anakims, and the land had rest for more. You know, in verse 11, he says, uh, I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me, as my strength was then. He said, you know, it's like God just put a hold when I hit 40 there. He said, I haven't changed one bit in the last. Boy, wouldn't that be wonderful? I'd, I'd settle for that. He said, as my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war. You know, it wasn't just that he was feeling good and feeling bright and he was still sort of spry. No, no, no. He said, um, he said, I'm still able to go to battle against the young men. He said, I can do it. And what he said was absolutely true. Not bad for 85 years old. You know, it wouldn't be a good idea to touch that old man. He'd beat you half to death. All the strength you need for as long as you need it. David said, I will go in the strength of the Lord God. Paul prayed for the church at Ephesus and he said, he said, I'm praying that God would grant you according to the riches of his grace to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Isaiah said, trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Look at Isaiah 40 with me. You hit Psalms and go to the right, you'll see Proverbs. And, and uh, you won't go far and you'll hit Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. He, he never runs out of strength. There is no searching of his understanding. 
Verse 29. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increases strength. And you know, it's not just about being young. Because the next verse says, even the youths shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They that wait upon the Lord. You know, Caleb had to wait. You know, the children of Israel went into wandering mode and um, and it was going to be another 45 years before Caleb got to claim what had been promised him. And, you know, it's like the Lord said, Caleb, you know, I got a blessing for you and, and I'm going to you're going to get it. And he said, I'm going to give you strength. That won't go away until that day. In another place, it says they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength as thy days. So shall thy strength be. You know, Asher got a huge blessing. It was a five in one blessing. You know, in that verse there in Deuteronomy 33, he promised him children. He promised him influence with his brethren. He promised him rivers of oil. He promised him a wise and protected walk. And he promised him strength, vitality right to the end. And, you know, we we went through this uh, this chapter there in, in Deuteronomy 33. If you want to go back there, uh, we've, we've been there for several weeks. And the chapter is full of blessings from the God who makes all these blessings come to his people. The Bible says, for the Lord is good. And that that means, the word good means inclined to bless. And as Moses closes out this passage, and these are some of the last words that we have on record that Moses ever spoke. As this passage closes, he breaks out into praise. I mean, he's it's just been blessing after blessing. And these blessings are going to be future for the children of Israel. Verse 26 He said, there is none like unto the God of Jeshurun who rideth upon the heaven in thy help. There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun. The word Jeshurun shows up four times in the Bible. And it's another name for Israel. And it literally means, um, it means to take the straight way. In other words, not the crooked way. It means to take the straight way to be upright. Um, Jeshurun was an honorable name, and it pictured Israel as a nation of just men, a righteous nation. And this name was intended to remind Israel of its calling. They were supposed to be a holy people. But it would also be a severe rebuke as they drifted from God. Sort of like the word Christian. The word Christian identifies a certain group of people. Now, I know in our in our, you know, in the religious world, that world's really gotten to be murky. And, you know, but but in the Bible sense, that word had a very specific meaning. It says that the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. They didn't come up with that name. God didn't tell somebody to call them that the outside world saw them and said, these men have been with Jesus. These men are like Jesus Christ. And the word Christian means like Christ, you know, in the Old Testament, if my people which are called by my name and the word Christian, it's it's we are called by his name that can be good and it can be bad. Um, You know, I've known people that uh, they've been out and about. They've been in town. They've been in an odd situation and somebody would watch how they behaved or they would listen to how they said something. And and this person would say in a good way, they'd say, you're a. Christian, aren't you? Boy, that's the good side. That's that's the way you want to hear it. That's that's that thing that says, man, you're you're one of those you're one of those people that follow the Lord. But it can also be said in a bad sense. You know, you heard somebody say, oh, well, you know, my uncle says he's a Christian and he does this and this and this and this. And and you know what that is? It's uh, it points to what they're not. You know, they ought to be like Christ because they claim his name. And that's the way the word Jeshurun was. 
And, and here in this passage, it says, There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun, the, the God of his good people, his righteous people that follow him. Look at 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter 2, verse 6. It says, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, I le- Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient. Whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, here it is, and a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which have not obtained mercy. But now have obtained mercy. And he says here, verse nine, you know, he's talking about who we are as believers. And he said, ye are an holy nation of peculiar people that she should show forth the praises of him. You know, we're his people. And um, and there should be something, you know, about us that points to him. Um, there is none like the God of Jeshurun. In Exodus 15, you don't have to turn there. It says, who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, faithful in praises, doing wonders? There is none like him. You know, Moses has just been blessing the socks off of people for tribes and for generations and for centuries here. And, and uh And man, he comes to the end of it. He realizes the magnitude of these blessings, the longevity of these blessings. And he realizes who gives them and how good he is in this passage. And he said, there is none like him. There's none like him. Who is like our God? Who is like him in his size? How big is God? In 2 Chronicles 2, Solomon is building the temple and... It says, and Solomon determined to build an house for the name of the Lord. But then he said this. He said, but who is able to build him an house? Seeing the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain him. In Jeremiah, the Lord said, do not I fill heaven and earth. Do not I fill heaven and earth. In Isaiah 40, it says this about the Lord. He measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and he meted out the heaven with a span. Meet means to measure. Okay, And he measured the heaven with a span. You know what a span is? A span is the space from the end of your thumb to the end of your little finger when you stretch it out as far as you can stretch it. And God said, that's how he measured the heaven. How big is he? How big is he to you? Who is like him? How big is he to you? Is he big enough to live for? You know, most of us have grown up in church, you know, and, and we know the right answers, you know. Most of us do. And you say, how big is God? Oh, preacher, he's big. And, you know, we, we know that. And intellectually, we, we accept that. And we really do believe that. But, you know, that's really not the question. The question is, how big is he to you? You know, a lot of Christians, um, you know, he he's, doesn't look like he's very big. He's Is he big enough to live for? Is he big enough to fill your view? Is he big enough to know what he's doing? Is he big enough to have the right viewpoint in 2024? You know, I laughed. I heard the other day <coughs> somebody said, you know, more and more and more and more you're seeing it on Instagram and Google and TikTok and all these places, you know, everybody wants to be an influencer, you know, and that's one of the big words. And everybody's pushing their opinion. And, you know, and, you know, everybody wants to think they, they've really got a big say in all this. Um, but 
How big is God in all this? Is he big enough? You know, you, you know, you pick up, you read these things, you know, people take sides and, and, and you know, is he big enough that he has the right viewpoint? Does his viewpoint count for anything? Is he big enough to preserve a book without error? Somebody says, oh, you know, preacher, all these other Bibles, you know, they're, they're really OK. There's no serious errors, just a few words here and there. OK, so I have a question. So why did he do a half job? Do you ever think about some of those things? Well, preacher, they're they're not all the same. And but, you know, it's generally good. That can't be. Is he that small? That he can't do what he said he would do. Why did he do a half job? I don't know about your God, but he doesn't have to do anything. He's big enough. He can get her done. Is he big enough to get her done? Why is he not big enough? Oh, there's none like him. Is he big enough to do what you don't understand? Is he big enough to disagree with you and me and still be right? Is he big enough to make the rules? Is he? Is he big enough to change you at your request? You know, I think some people feel like they're doomed in their personality. You know, they're they're sort of doomed in their way of life. When you're young, you know, um, I remember going to a doctor years ago, and he was really, really an unusual doctor, really sharp guy. And in those days, I was like 31, 32, 33, somewhere in there. And um, the doc looked at me. And he had a discussion with me about some of my eating habits, you know, one of those wonderful conversations that you just enjoy. And um, and he said to me, he said, Mr. Newman, and he's looking at me, he's about 65, 70. And he says, Mr. Newman, he said, you're young. He said, you can change everything. He said, but some of my patients, they come in here and he just shook his head. He said. They're too far down the road. You know, I think the devil gets on some Christian shoulders. And, and uh, the only difference with that is maybe that's maybe that's true in the in a general way for a lot of people outside of God. But, you know, uh, um, the Lord, how big is he? Is 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 he not big enough? Uh, you know, if, if you want to change some things, do you realize that you can tell the devil goodbye? He is a liar from the beginning. You say, well, I've always been this way and this is my personality and this is such a part of me. And that may be true and it may be bigger than you. And you may realize I can't change this, even though you long to. But boy, I got good news. He's big enough. I mean, if he could speak the universe into existence. I think he can handle you and me. I think he can fix it. I think he can do something in your heart. And I think he would rejoice because it would give him glory because he did it at your phase of life. Is he big enough? There's none like the God of Jeshurun. Is he big enough to answer a big request? You got any big requests? Is he he big enough? Can you pray it and honestly put some hope in it? You pray it sort of faithlessly, and and we all do that sometimes. But you know, that's when you need to catch yourself and realize he fills heaven and earth. He's big enough. You're you're little. It's so big to you, but it's, it's not big to him. Is he big enough to change everything in 24 hours? Man, I was just reading the other day in Second Kings 7, and uh, you don't have to turn there, but there was a famine in the land of Israel, and it was terrible. And, you know, the, Israel brought it on themselves, and, and God had been gracious and merciful and kind, but they just kept going their own way and going their own way. And, going. and so finally God did what he promised. Uh, God said, you know, if you get away from me in the latter days, God says there's some things I'm going to do. And one of the things he said that he would do, he would send famine. This famine was terrible and it had been ongoing for a long time. And um, it was so bad. And this was prophesied. You know, you and me, we, we just we, we really don't understand. I can't understand 
being this hungry. But this this lady, this this lady comes to the king and she says, King, I, I, I want you to solve my problem. And the king says, what is your problem? He said, well, she said, um, she said, uh, I had an agreement with my neighbor. And we were going to kill my son and boil him and eat him yesterday. And we were supposed to eat his her son today. And she she has hid her son. You know, there's some of stuff that's just unthinkable, right? And the king just, the king said, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill Elisha. He was blaming it on Elisha. He said, I'm going to kill Elisha. In the next chapter, Elisha makes his appearance. And uh, he says, uh, he said, I want you to send a message. He said, I want you to tell the king that tomorrow at this time, he said, food will be so abundant and it'll be so cheap that it'll just be like the old days. It'll be unbelievable. And the guy that the guy that is getting this message says he's he was full of faith. If God opened the windows of heaven, this thing's not going to happen. And Elisha said, it's going to happen. And he said, and you're going to die. Many Old Testament prophets, they didn't mess around. <laughs> he had been better off just say, yes, sir. I don't believe it, but yes, sir. You know what he was saying? He was saying in 24 hours. This wasn't a personal situation. This was a national distress. How big is God? And Elisha said, you tell him that God's going to turn it all around in 24 hours. Do you believe he can do that? you believe he can do that? There is none like the God of Jeshurun in his size. Man, he is big enough. You got some lost family members you're praying for? He's big enough. Does it look hopeless? Yeah, but you're looking at the wrong place. He's big enough. There is none like him in his size. There is none like him in his power to bless. Deuteronomy 33 shows this in living color. Twelve different tribes, twelve different families. Some blessings were larger than others. But each blessing was suited to that tribe. In some cases, it almost seems like God was looking for something to bless because there wasn't much there. But God was so good, he wanted to bless anyway. Some were blessed because of their great suffering. Some were blessed because they made a right choice. And some of the blessings that were given, there was no visible reason. But for every one of them, it flowed out of the goodness of God. And that blessing that was pronounced was not a thing for a day or a week. You know, a starving man to hand him, you know, a a, a big pizza with all his favorite stuff on it. Well, that's good for one meal. But if I was starving to death and somebody handed me a pizza and said, you know, enjoy this. (laughs) There won't be any more for another six months. I I don't know how, how much of a blessing that would be. But this wasn't what he was doing. He was giving them a blessing for them and their children and their children and their children. And it would continue for years and centuries ahead. You know, only God can do this. There is none like him in his power to bless. There's nobody like him. There is none like him in his power to judge. No one like him. Matthew 21, Jesus walking with his disciples. And it was the time of the first ripe figs. And uh, Jesus comes up to this tree. And um, and Jesus was looking for fruit on this tree. And there was no fruit on the tree. And Jesus looks at this tree. And the disciples are standing there. And Jesus says, let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And it says, and presently, that means immediately. The tree withered away. Jesus walks up to this tree. There's no fruit. He curses the tree and it goes here. (laughs) Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed unto men once to die. But after this, the judgment. 
In Ecclesiastes 12, it says, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. And I love this, whether it be good or whether it be evil. You know, we always think of the, the dark side of that, you know. And uh, But oh, there's some good things coming out of the judgment. There's some good things. Some people suffered privately because they did right. Some people did some things for God that nobody ever knew. Some people did some things for the Lord that seemed so small that they thought they really didn't amount to much. But it's all coming out and the blessings will be huge because there's nobody like him and his power to bless or judge. He hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. He's appointed a day. You know, he's going to get it all done in one day. It'll be one of those heavenly days. You know, there is no night there. God says, I've got a day. Would you look at Psalm 9 with me? Psalm 9. There's none like the God of Jeshurun. In his size, in his power to bless, and in his power to judge. Psalm 9, verse 1. I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. You know, that's what we do when we come in these services. We're not doing this just because it's the it's part of the manual and it's because what we're supposed to do. No. The whole point of this is, I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. Verse 3. When mine enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Thou sattest in the throne judging right. Thou hast rebuked the heathen. Thou hast destroyed the wicked. Thou hast put out their name forever and ever. O thou enemy Destructions are come to a perpetual end, and thou hast destroyed cities. Their memorial is perished with them, but the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment, and he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. Look at verse 15. The heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made. In the net which they hid is their own foot taken. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Pegion Selah. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. For the needy, here's a good side of judgment. The needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in thy sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Selah. You know, there is none like him in his power to bless and his power to judge. And there is none like him in his power to save. Jesus came walking on the scene. He was 30 years old. John the Baptist had been waiting for that day. The Bible says that he didn't even know Jesus by sight. But Jesus came walking up and suddenly he knew who it was. And he shouted to the multitudes that were gathered at his baptisms. He said, behold, he said, look right there. He said, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The Bible says in Hebrews, he came to taste death for every man. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. It was absolutely finished. In Isaiah 63, the Lord speaks of himself and he said, I am mighty to save. Man, there's nobody like him that can save. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. He said, he said everywhere in the earth. 
He said, just look this way. He says, if you'll look to me. He said, I'll save you. Because there's no one like me. There's none like him. Some of you know it. And even as we're saying these words, something sweet's welling up in your heart. Boy, there's just none like him. Is he your God? Is he your big God? Can you honestly and gladly say, gladly say, there is no one like my God? I want to encourage you. Keep talking to him. Get a fresh look at him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. They turned to God from their idols. They realized, whoa, he's the big God and my gods are nothing. Whether it be a stone or a statue or a religious relic or whether it be their money or their fame or, you know, their accomplishments. They realized I'm I'm all caught up in the wrong place. They turn to God. Is he your God? There is none like him. Let's pray. There's none like him in his power to bless, in his power to judge, in his power to save. Boy, judgment day is coming. You want to make sure that you know him in his power to save. Lord, help us now in Jesus' name we pray. God has spoken to you. Why don't you talk to him? Can you gladly say there's none like my God? He said in Psalm 100, serve the Lord with gladness. He's interested in your gladness. Lord, thank you for these words. God, we thank you, Lord, that uh, there's nobody like you, Lord. And 
God, we thank you that you're our Savior. Lord, we pray that you bless these truths to our heart. We pray you'd apply them and, Lord, help them. Lord, help us that we would um, carry them with us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you.